Take your Bibles and turn with me to that portion of Scripture which we read just a moment ago in Exodus chapter 1, verses 8 through 14. We began the book of Exodus last week looking at the first seven verses, though we read the entire context of verses 1 through 17, and we noted the importance of God's people being strong not only in their personal faith but also in numbers and how important it is. And we noted why it is important to study the book of Exodus by looking at simply three terms that are reoccurrent in the New Testament. We saw that the law is mentioned in the New Testament 172 times, two-thirds as many times as the Old Testament. Or in other words, 40% of the mentions of the law in the entire Bible, 40% are in the New Testament. Mount Sinai, we found four key times that it was mentioned in the New Testament, which explains to us how God views the law in Acts chapter 2, twice, and in Galatians, two times. We saw that Moses is mentioned 80 times in the New Testament. That's more than 10% of all the mentions of Moses in the entire Bible. We saw that as we contrast 
law and grace, which is the heart of the Reformation. We saw grace appears 131 times in the New Testament, but it only occurs 39 times in the Old Testament. And how many wonderful references there are in the book of Romans, in Galatians, in Titus, and elsewhere in the New Testament where we look at the grace of God and how it deals with sin versus looking at the law of God and how it deals with sin. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law but under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law but under grace? God forbid. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And if by grace, then it's no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. And so on. We looked at a dozen or more passages in the New Testament which help us to understand why it is so important to understand the function of the law and the function of grace. And the connecting truths concerning faith. We talked about the practical application of the law versus grace. And that there are those who desire to be teachers of the law, but they understand neither what they say nor whereof they affirm. We saw that the law is made to condemn. The law is not made to justify. And Paul explains it is a very important aspect of national government. And we'll come uh, to a little bit more of that as we get further here into the book of Exodus. Absolutely important for national government. But it is not the law upon which the church is based. It is upon the grace of Christ and his death on the cross that the church is based. The law is good, Paul says in Titus chapter 1, if a man use it lawfully, knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine. The law is absolutely essential for the suppression of sin in the national context. And we'll talk more about that later. We saw it's important to study Exodus because that gives us the beginning of the nation of Israel. And 106 times God refers to the forming of Israel as a nation with the words or similar words, I brought thee out of Egypt. This is the beginning of all the Old Testament covenant promises leading to the arrival of the Messiah and the transition from law to grace and how we, we see this magnificent season when we celebrate the Incarnation and how important it is to understand that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law. And it is only as we are related to Him that we have divine righteousness before God. We cannot be righteous by merely keeping the law ourselves. You will wear yourself out and you will still fail if that is the way you think that you are going to be saved or if that is the way that you think that you will be sanctified. Christ fulfilled the law. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness doesn't mean he obliterates all moral standards. It means he's the end of the law for righteousness. If you want righteousness, you must go to Christ. Christ alone can give to you by imputation divine righteousness transferred from the books of heaven to your account so that you are seen in him as declared righteous by God and made righteous by the blood of Christ. How important it is, for there is much, much confusion on this today. Many who are struggling to make their way to heaven or to find themselves pleasing to God by the things which they do, rather than allowing the Spirit of God to bear the fruit of the Spirit in them and being seen by God in Christ. And then finally we saw the practical application to real life in the 21st century. Right from this very first chapter which is the murder of babies. That goes back a long way. Pharaoh tried to do it and kill off all the male baby Israelites 1,400 years before Christ. How important for us it is to understand that there are practical implications as set forth for us in the scriptures so that we would not fall into the same kind of evil that they fell. Paul tells us that in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. These things are written for our examples. Examples. 
so that we could learn practical truth, not merely a, a, a framework of theology that we sit up here but has no absolute practical application for us. And we saw that children are an heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. And we saw what happens to those who reject God's heritage in Jeremiah. And thou even thyself shalt discontinue from thine heritage that I gave thee. Children are an heritage of the Lord. The heritage that I gave thee. And I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knowest not. Takes us back to Pharaoh and the book of Exodus. Takes us forward into the future as to what happens to those children of God, those, those who call on the name of Christ when they reject his heritage. I will cause thee to serve thine enemies in the land which thou knewest not, for ye have kindled a fire in mine anger which shall burn forever. And Peter picks up that theme in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 3. Neither is being lords over God's heritage. That's clearly people he's talking about there, all of whom were babies at one time, but being examples to the flock. We saw the two different ways that Satan uses to keep God's people under his thumb. He causes oppression and he brings murder. You see, Pharaoh didn't want the children of Israel to leave. He wanted them to stay. He recognized there was some benefit in having them there as his slaves. If he had simply wanted to get them out of the land, he could have told them, pack up your bags and leave. He could have expelled them from the country, uh, as uh, we find in the New Testament, when Caesar Augustus commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Ananias and Sapphira were part of that exodus. There were others later in that book that were part of that exodus, and they're explained in the book of Acts. Birth control and abortion are not merely human political ploys, as we saw, but the work of Satan to eliminate God's people, if he possibly can. So that brings us to our text today. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, which knew not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come on, let us deal wisely with them. The wisdom of the world, that's our message for today. Let us deal wisely with them. How does the world deal with God's people? What is the wisdom of the world? Have we as Christians fallen into the way that the world thinks around us. How much different it is than we see the wisdom of God which sent his son to be our savior. And indeed much of the New Testament speaks on that. The first phrase is a new king over Egypt. Nations often lose their moorings and apart from righteous constitutional governments, we've seen it happen on a number of occasions, even during our lifetime in foreign nations, we see it happening here in the United States. Let me give you some basic principles concerning national government. This is a condensation of many things that are set forth in scripture, but it's a condensation so that you'll see how it applies here in the text. A nation is only as strong as its leaders are wise and righteous. You can see that throughout the entire history of both Israel and Judah. A nation is only as strong as its leaders are wise and righteous. Number two, a nation is good only as long as it has a righteous government kept in check by righteous laws. When we find during the reign, for example, of King David that he is applying the law of God, we find his nation is at peace. We find when he departs from it, when he violates it himself, we find his nation plunged into chaos. Principle number three, a righteous government is defined as a government that submits to and obeys the law of God. You will never have peace for God's people in any nation that refuses to submit to and obey the law of God. That is the definition of a righteous government. And finally, it is the responsibility of God's people in whatever nation they find themselves, a fourfold responsibility. One, to pray for leaders in government. You often hear me quoting that portion of text from the New Testament that we pray for those in authority over us that we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and in honesty. 
Number two, it is God's people's responsibility to support righteous legislation and righteous judicial decisions. We have the freedom in this country, at least for now, to stand up for what is right and to be counted, and to let our officials know when they have done what is right. Very few people ever contact their legislators. Certainly very few people speak out publicly when they hear of a good judicial decision. And yet those who are evil will harangue and harass until they get their way, like a naughty and spoiled child who throws a temper tantrum on the floor until the parent gives in and gives them what they want. We need to be an encouragement to those who are in positions of authority by letting them know that we appreciate the legislation that they pass that provides good and right things for our country and especially for believers. Number three, we need to vote for righteous leaders. People, we have opportunities in this country that most countries of the world do not have. We actually have the right to participate in our government. We have the right to go to the polls and vote. But before you vote, make sure that you check out what those who are running for office stand for. Does it comply with the word of God? Too often, and many of the polls demonstrate this, the popular polls that are set forth to the people, many times we find that there are those who are not registered to vote or who do not go to the polls who claim to be Bible-believing Christians. Is it any wonder that Satan, who is always active in the political realm, is making headway in our country? Number four, as God leads, it is the responsibility of God's people to run for political office. Now, I'm not going to talk politics this morning, but I want you to understand what's happened here in the text that we have before us. God's people have had 400 years in Egypt at this point. They have had peace for 400 years. They have had prosperity for 400 years. They have been going through the motions of life for 400 years. They've multiplied. They've become wealthy. Everything seems to be going their way. But suddenly things are about to be slammed into reverse as they are going 70 miles an hour. And you know what that will do to your car if you slam it into reverse when you're going 70 miles an hour. It will utterly destroy you. We need to learn practical lessons from what God teaches us here in this chapter. Without the restraining influence and activity of God's people in a nation, a nation will always plunge into the depths of depravity and then it will come under the judgment of God. I don't think we want that to happen here in our country. The second little phrase that we see here before us today in verse 8, it says, which knew not Joseph. Clearly, Pharaoh did not only not know Joseph, he didn't know Joseph's God. I think this is self-evident, that self-willed men, and Paul talks about that at the church at Ephesus in Acts chapter 20, it happens in the church as well as in government, self-willed men will arise who refuse to bow to righteous president that has been established. They will refuse to bow to any president whereby God's people can increase. They will refuse to bow to any precedent whereby God's people can actually be a national blessing. Just think back to Sodom and Gomorrah. As Abraham is speaking with, with the Lord himself and Abraham is bargaining, well, if there are 50 righteous, will you destroy it? No, if there are 40 righteous, will you destroy it? 45 righteous, 40, 30, 20, 10. Abraham gives up at 10. He thinks there must be at least 10 righteous. God says, I won't destroy it even for 10. God's people, by their very presence, are a blessing to a nation even when it is a wicked nation. Dear people, how are we living in our country? You know, he knew not Joseph, 
He's one of the self-willed men. He's like the wolves that the Apostle Paul warns about who are going to rise up after Paul's departure and enter the church and rip it to shreds. Righteousness exalteth a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Proverbs 14.34 Something else that Pharaoh didn't know. He did not know the wisdom by which Joseph had governed. He's changing national policy. Joseph governed in wisdom, and as a result, there was tremendous blessing and increase to Egypt. Egypt became the power that it was because of the wisdom by which Joseph had governed and how that lasted for four centuries. He did not know the wisdom with which Joseph had governed. You know all of our textbooks are being changed. If you pick up a modern textbook... And this was done a number of years ago where, uh, in Texas, it was almost 35 years ago, there was a, a young couple, then young at that time, named the Gablers. They had some children in public school. And uh, they wanted to see, they wanted to be involved in their children's education. So they got copies of the textbooks that were being used in the public schools. And this was 35 years or more ago. They were horrified they discovered that more space was given to Marilyn Monroe than to George Washington. They discovered that the entire Christian basis for our company, country had been eliminated from the textbooks. They became actively involved. And so textbook publishers, because text, the textbook committees in, in Texas allow the textbooks to be spread among people who are interested and who are willing to read them, and then to make comment before the textbook committee. The Gablers made such a stir with that that the publishers at that time began to produce a separate edition for the schools in Texas. Different from all the other books by the same title, looked like the same cover under that name, but for the schools in Texas, because one couple got involved. Yes, Joseph was a man who set precedent and established a history for Egypt that they could have continued another 400 years. But there are those who refuse to bow to righteousness that's been established. And so they refuse the wisdom of the past. How important it is for us in teaching our children and our grandchildren to study the Christian leaders who founded this country. To understand the principles upon which they based our government because our children and grandchildren, if our Lord tarries and does not bring oppression before, will be in the generation that needs to move into leadership in the United States. Arnold Toynbee once said, those who forget, he's a great historian, those who forget the lessons of history are doomed to repeat it. There's something else that's very interesting about this, is the devil's people watch God's people. Pharaoh clearly knew that God's people were different. He said, look, we see them around us, they're multiplying. We've got to deal with it wisely. He was watching what was going on in his realm. He knew that God's people were different. They had led clearly distinct and separated lives, set apart lives for 400 years. They had not intermarried with the pagans. They had not polluted the holy seed of Israel. God had blessed them with children. Behold, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. He knew they were different. Does the world around us know that we're any different? Or we do function the same way that the pagans around us function. They can't tell any difference between us and them. We just sort of blend into the woodwork. Pharaoh knew that God's people were different. We learn one other thing here, because it's talking about Pharaoh speaking to his people. It tells us that God's people had failed to participate in governmental affairs, although that door had clearly been opened to them by Joseph's position in government. As a result, there came a time when the history of the nation fell into the dim memory past, and the leaders of the nation began to actively reject the blessings of that history that God had brought to Egypt. You know, living a separated life, and this is very important for us to understand. 
We believe in separation. It's very clear here in this church. Living a separated life does not mean living an isolationist life where we go into our own little shell, close the doors, and nobody can see or hear us or have any impact from us being there. That's isolationism. It means living a pure, irreproachable, God-glorifying life that is distinct from the world, but which makes an impact for Christ in the world. We are to be in the world, but not of the world. You see, the children of Israel had forgotten that. They were so busy making lots of money, having lots of flocks, having an expansive, beautiful land, building their houses and doing their thing, that it never occurred to them that perhaps there would come a day when the government no longer treated them nicely as it had done in the past. Positions by Christians in governmental leadership is not to be snubbed by other Christians as unspiritual. There are some people who will tell you, politics, that's dirty, you should never be involved in it. Yes, of course it's dirty, so is business. So is the military. So is the police force. So is everything that you can get involved in. So is farming. You get dirt under your fingernails there too. It is not unspiritual. That's the height of hypocrisy. Christians are involved in all those things, in the military, in the police force, in business of every type, from farming to international industry, from the production of goods to the giving of services. In business, every sort of any kind, there's always the horrible temptation for covetousness and for compromise and for misplaced priorities. No reason not to be involved there. We're supposed to be involved in whatever God sets our hand to do, do it with our might and do it for his glory. But Satan is the one who does not want Christians involved in politics and government. He wants to control the seat of power because he knows that he can use it against the people of God. We find some very critical points, turning points in the history of God's people because God's people were involved in the political realm. In scripture, you think about Daniel. You think about Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These were men involved in the politics of Babylon, which is considered the wickedest empire of them all. It is Babylon where the rebellion begins in Genesis with Nimrod. It is Babylon that is under the curse of God by the time we get to the book of Revelation in chapters 17 and 18. Babylon the Great has finally fallen. It is Babylon where Daniel is the chief advisor to the king. Christians involved in politics. How about the book of Esther? We find Mordecai. We find Esther in the highest positions of political power and they make provision for the people of God. How about Nehemiah? The king's cupbearer who is sent as the prince who rebuilds the walls of Jerusalem for the benefit of God's people. Let's bring it to the Christmas season. How about the wise men? You've heard me preach about the wise men. They were the king makers of Persia. They were the ones, the Magoi, who crowned the kings of Persia. They were the ones who brought the gifts to the Christ child. God's people involved at critical points of history, actively involved in their governments, and holding forth and standing for that which is true and righteous and just for the benefit of God's people. Come, let us deal wisely with them. You know, the pagans will always view believers as a threat. They'll not view us as a blessing. Although from the divine viewpoint, believers are a blessing to the country in which they are found. The pagans are almost always more alert. Notice this here in this text. The pagans are almost always more alert to what they perceive as dangers than God's people are. We are like the ostrich with a head in the sand. We don't realize the danger until it's upon us. This also tells us that activity against the people of God is not haphazard 
It's not accidental. It's not bad luck. It's being carefully planned and orchestrated by people at different levels of power. You here have experienced it in this church. When there were open discussions at the town council meetings about wanting to take this property away from this church and turn it into a commercial center. It was being planned in the city planning to do that. God mercifully spared it. People, these things are not haphazard. They are not accidental. They are not bad luck. They are carefully planned and orchestrated by people at different levels of power. And it is normally kept from the knowledge of God's people until the moment that the axe falls. Notice, and he said unto his people. He wasn't making this a public announcement to everybody else. But you know, even in the midst of this, we find that what God is doing, we find the overarching sovereign plan of God, that God is preparing for a Redeemer. One who will lead his people out. You think about the pressure that came on the pilgrims. Oh, they were harried and hounded in England. They fled to Holland. They realized that Holland was such a, a, a morass of worldly ways. Their young people were being lost. And so God used that to force them out. And they came to America where they could establish a government that glorified God. That was their design. Not a secular government. But one whereby God's people would have the freedom to proclaim the truth of the word of God. God was preparing for a redeemer for Moses, whom we find through the rest of this book. You know, God has done that on multiple occasions. You think about the oppression of the Roman Empire, and Rome sends forth a decree that all the world must be taxed. God is preparing for a redeemer, and he brings the Lord Jesus Christ. That's this season. That's the incarnation. That's what we celebrate at this time. There was the oppression of Rome, the heavy boot of iron, crushing God's people, and God prepared a Redeemer. We find that before the return of our Lord Jesus Christ, things are going to get worse and worse and worse, and Paul tells us that in the New Testament. But we don't have to be ignorant of it. Before Christ comes for his bride, the church, we find that during the tribulation, things are going to get worse and worse and worse for national Israel. And then the Redeemer is going to come. You see, God uses these times of oppression and persecution to prepare his people to look for a redeemer. Oh, how we thank God that we know who that redeemer is, our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we see him speaking of wisdom here. Let us deal wisely with them. Oh, what an important contrast we have with divine wisdom and worldly wisdom. You know, our Lord Jesus Christ told us that the children of this world are wiser in their generation than the believers are, the children of light. In his parable in Luke chapter 16, the first part of the chapter, last half, of course, you know, deals with the resurrection and with Lazarus and Abraham. Uh, Abraham's bosom, the rich man and Lazarus. But the first part of the chapter, he gives a parable of the unjust steward. Listen to it carefully. He said unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man which had a steward, and the same was accused unto him that he had wasted his goods. And he called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of thee? Give an account of thy stewardship, for thou mayest no longer be steward. Now, folks, we've got a stewardship. Think in terms of yourself, in terms of stewardships. We have been entrusted with the gospel of Jesus Christ. This steward is about to be put out of his stewardship and to lose all the benefits of his stewardship. Then the steward said within himself, Now here is how the unbelieving steward, the one who did not want to walk by faith, the one who did not want to repent, how he responded. The steward said within himself, What shall I do? For my Lord taketh away from me the stewardship. I cannot dig. To beg I am ashamed. I am resolved what to do. That when I am put out of the stewardship, they, that is the Lord's debtors, how they may receive me into their houses. 
Now I want to pause for just a second and show you a contrast. You've got the word houses in verse 4. It's the Greek word for houses. We find the word habitations down in verse 9, but that's not houses. That's the word for tents. Where would you rather live, in a house or in a tent? Keep that in mind as we go through this parable. So he called every one of his Lord's debtors unto him and said unto the first, How much owest thou my, unto my Lord? This was a steward who had not kept any records. He had no idea how much all of these debtors owed. He had kept no books. He had to ask them how much they owed. And he said, A hundred measures of oil. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. Then he said to another, And how much owest thou? And he said, An hundred measures of wheat. And he said unto him, Take thy bill and write four score. Now verse 8. Here's our key verse. And the Lord commended the unjust steward, because he had done wisely. For the children of this world are in their generation wiser than the children of light. The key phrase is, in their generation. The way in which they are living right now in the world, they are functioning with the wisdom of the world. They're making ends meet for themselves. They're keeping their eye on the bottom line of their own bank accounts. Whereas the children of this world don't understand their stewardship. And I say unto you, make to yourselves friends of the mammon of unrighteousness, that when you fall they may receive you into everlasting habitations. That's the word tense. Everlasting. Everlasting. You're not going to go, you pagans, to a home prepared for you, a mansion prepared for you. You're going to go to an everlasting tent a difference and of course we know what that will be like he that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much he that is unjust in least is unjust also in much if therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon that's money who will commit to your trust the true riches if we don't deal wisely with what God has entrusted to us here if we're using the wisdom of the world to make a nice little nest egg for ourselves and not thinking of eternity, those are the unrighteous riches of mammon. Who will entrust to your care true riches? Things that last forever. If you've been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give if you have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which is your own? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. Stewards, that's what we are. Stewardship, that's what we've got. The unrighteous are busy with their stewardship, cheating and bending the rules and doing what the unrighteous steward did here. That's the wisdom of the world. But listen to Paul contrasting it in 1 Corinthians verse 1 and 18 and following. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. That's the wisdom of the world. The cross is different than that. I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. And verse 25, because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than man. The wisdom of the world contrasted with the wisdom of God. The wisdom of the world tied to the cross. The wisdom of the world tied to money. Oh, how often we are pulled to the wisdom of the world and the money that's there. Instead of being pulled by the wisdom of God to the preaching of of the cross where true wisdom and only true wisdom is found 
Come, let us deal wisely with them, he said. Oh, how sad it is for that wisdom related to power and money. Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 2, 4, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of power. Man's wisdom is to manipulate. God's wisdom is to allow the Holy Spirit of God to move through you and to flow through you and to accomplish that which is humanly impossible in the power of the Spirit of God. Verse 7, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto glory. Verse 6, howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, not the wisdom of this world, nor of the princes of the world that come to naught. You see, they thought they were doing wisely when they killed Christ. And Paul mentions it here in the passage, I'll read it in a second. That was the wisdom that the Sanhedrin had when they brought the charges against Christ, they, saw, they had said themselves on the triumphal entry day, they said, you know, we better be careful because otherwise the Romans are going to come and take away our authority from us. we got to get rid of this man. Because otherwise we're going to run into trouble with our power. That was the same kind of wisdom that Pilate had. Pilate looked out at the mob and as he said, I'm going to release him, they yelled, crucify him, crucify him. And he realized that a, a tumult was being raised and he thought, okay, political expediency. I'll get rid of this one guy and I'll settle the mob down. That's the wisdom of the world. Listen to what Paul says about that event. He says, which none of the princes of this world knew, speaking of the wisdom of God in the preceding verse, the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the world unto our glory, which none of the princes of this world knew, for had they known it, had they known it, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. If Satan and his henchmen had understood what the cross was all about, they would never have crucified Christ, for they would have known that that was the very point of their defeat. Dear people, the wisdom of God is so different than the wisdom of men. The Apostle Paul explains in chapter 3, it's a main theme as we move through the first part of 1 Corinthians, let no man deceive himself. If any man among you seem to be wise in this world, let him become a fool that he may be wise. In other words, quit relying on the wisdom of the world. Be a fool in the world's sight so that you may really be wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God, for it is written, he taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And again, the Lord knoweth the thoughts of the wise that they are vain. 2 Corinthians 1 verse, I know our time is expiring here. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world, and more abundantly to you word. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. We're not using the fleshly wisdom of the world, but we rely it says, by the grace of God, we have our conversation. That's the old English word for our manner of life. We are lights and testimony. We have a manner of life in the world. And more abundantly, to you word. You say, but I, I don't have any wisdom. I, I don't know how to deal with things. There are two ways to do it. Number one, you study God's word. And then you say, I don't understand it. Okay, James 1. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is as a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. Let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. There is no excuse for not having divine wisdom. There is, did you get that? If you're a believer, there is no excuse for not having divine wisdom. Oh, how we yearn after the wisdom of the world. God gives us wisdom for free. Let me just close by giving you some contrasts here. The difference between the world's wisdom and divine wisdom. Number one, the wisdom of the world is always self-centered and focused on self-preservation. Self-centered self-preservation. Divine wisdom is other-centered and sacrificial. Christ has made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption.
Jesus Christ came into the world not because he was self-centered. He took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Self-sacrifice, that's divine wisdom. Other-centered, not self-centered. Number two, the wisdom of the world is temporal in nature only. All the people who have worldly wisdom are thinking in terms of the here and now and never setting their eyes above the horizon. In contrast, divine wisdom has eternity always in view. What impact will this make in relation to eternity? Number three, the wisdom of the world is based on a fallen world view. All they know is the sinful world around us. But that worldview is not the worldview from God's perspective. Divine wisdom is the Christian worldview from God's perspective that includes redemption and forgiveness and reconciliation and eternal life. The wisdom of the world eliminates the possibility of divine intervention. They don't think that even if there is a God out there, sort of like the deistic God, the watchmaker God, who wound the world up and then walked away and ignores it, they think God will never intervene. That's their wisdom. So they move right ahead, thinking that they're getting away with what they're doing. But divine wisdom includes the sovereignty of God in all earthly activities. There is a God from heaven who controls everything because he will fulfill his purpose. The wisdom of the world is based on the manipulation of the sin nature of man. That's what advertising is all about. Manipulating the sin nature of man so that they can entice you to buy their goods even though you don't need them. The manipulation of the sin nature of man. Divine wisdom is based on the condemnation of sin and provision for sin through the blood of Christ. The wisdom of the world always results. I know how important this is for us to understand because we can test whether or not we're applying divine wisdom or not. The wisdom of the world always results in the active implementation of sinful activities and lies. Divine wisdom always results in righteous actions based on the truth. The wisdom of the world, Pharaoh had it. Pharaoh brings his oppression. But even in the midst, even in the midst of his wicked activities and his oppression of God's people, God uses that to bring judgment upon Pharaoh and deliverance for his people, as we'll see when we get to chapter 14. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you once again that you not only provided a redeemer who led Israel out of Egypt, you have provided a redeemer for us. It was a time of great oppression. All the world was being taxed under Caesar Augustus. Joseph and Mary, Mary great with child, making a horrendously difficult, painful journey from Nazareth to Bethlehem. Because in your sovereignty you had ordained that the Messiah would come through the seed, the line of David. And it was at that point of oppression you gave us our Savior. How we rejoice in that at this season. How we rejoice in the fact that you sent your Son. Your word has told us that often there are situations where believers come under oppression and then you raise up a deliverer for them. And we see many illustrations of that throughout the Old Testament, a few in the New Testament, of those whom you have put in positions of political power so that they might do good for your people. Father, we pray that you will help us to remember to pray for those whom you've put at every level of government in authority over us. That we might lead quiet and peaceable lives in godliness and honesty. And that means not merely having good business deals, but that means so that we might share the gospel of Christ. And do it. We pray, Father, that you will take this your word and use it in each of our hearts to the glory of your Son.
our Savior, in whose name we pray. Amen.